Hello everyone, welcome to the third lecture in this uh, lecture series, 40 Under 40. Uh, we are pleased to have here Professor Kim Kwong Le from uh, Lund University. Um, I'm going to start with a brief introduction, a brief uh, bio about uh, uh, Professor Le. She, she is an associate senior lecturer now assistant professor in the division of combustion physics at Lund University in Sweden. Uh, our research group focuses on advancing uh, laser-based diagnostics, uh, diagnostic techniques to investigate soot, uh, both the laboratory settings and the atmosphere. Uh, professor Le started her research journey in 2013 uh, with a PhD at the Institut de Science Moléculaire d'Orsay in France. And uh, during her PhD, she developed and utilized uh, optical and laser-based methods, including online Raman scattering, um, uh, absorption uh, spectroscopy, and F-tier spectroscopy uh, to examine the properties of soot particles. Uh, after obtaining her PhD in 2017, Professor Lee was awarded uh, a Marie Curie Individual Fellowship and uh, she carried out her Marie Curie research in the uh, Division of Combustion Physics at uh, Lund University, uh, where she continued to apply these uh, spectroscopic uh, techniques. Uh, in 2021, she was uh, finally appointed to a tenure track uh, um, professorship at Lund University. So yeah, it's uh, Professor Lee Kwong, it's great to, it is great to have you here and uh, I, I leave you the, the, the virtual floor, please. Yeah, thank you, Sambato, for the kind invitation and introduction. And thank you all of you for participating in my lecture. So let us share screen. Let's see. Uh, can you see it now? I guess. Yes. It is in the presenting mode. It is. Okay, good. Okay, so. Uh, today, I will talk about characterizing soot using ex situ and online spectroscopy. But first, I would like to acknowledge the contribution of uh, my college uh, at Lund University and also my former college at uh, France and some collaborators from Sweden, Italy, and France, as you can see their name here. And of course, it is very important to have a financial support from many different funding agency um, help for my research. So in this presentation, I will talk three main content. The first one is the ex situ spectroscopy, including Raman, Fourier transform infrared, and ultraviolet absorption. And then I will move to the online technique, uh, particularly the online Raman technique, and then some other application. So soot, I will talk about soot, and uh, actually it's not a strange term for you. It's very familiar with all of us. So you see soot from when you light the candle or when you do the barbecue. Soot is actually the carbon nanomaterial produced from incomplete combustion or pyrolysis of hydrocarbon. And it's not a unit well-defined material. Under high resolution, microscope, you can see soot appear as many aggregates. Each aggregate contains few 10 to few hundred primary particles. Each primary particle have a size around few to few 10 nanometers. And their structure contains amorphous structure and graffiti structure. For mature soot, the graffiti structure located in the, the border of the particle and it contains many graffiti layers stuck on its order. And uh, the parallel graffiti layers we call is the basic structure unit. And the length of this unit we call is polyaromatic unit mean size, what we, we, we will talk a lot uh, during this presentation. And my study focus on the uh, um, study in soup properties and soup formation processes in remiss flame at low pressure and at atmospheric pressure. So soup produced in rich flame condition 
if we change the flame condition, for example, we change the fuel, fuel oxidant ratio, temperature, pressure, or the time of the particle in the flame, we can produce different type of soot. And uh, actually, the formation of soot is very complicated. So, but it can be divided into two stages the formation of soot precursor and then the formation of soot particle or the growth of soot particles as illustrated in this, uh, in this uh, image you can see here. Last two weeks, you heard about um, also soot presented by uh, Bernadetta uh, at CNRS in France. She also present her, one, her beautiful research about the evolution of soot in the flame, but she focused on the, um, the size of the particle. In my work, I focus more on the structure of the particle. Okay, why and how can we characterize soot? Uh, you may know that soot have uh, the color is black because it strongly absorbs light. And when the soot emitted in the atmosphere is absorbed solar radiation and heats up the atmosphere, so it's caused global warming. And also the structure of soot is very complicated. It uh, can um, react with other compounds in the atmosphere and it can be a carrier of different toxicity. So when it go into our body, it can cause DNA damage or um, oxidative stress, then it's got a lot of different type of cancer. That's the reason why we feel it's a very interesting topic. And uh, maybe all of you heard about this story when you were a child, the blind man and elephant. So it's the same in our case. In order to study suit, what we don't know, we can do different tune and look at this at different angle. Each tune can pro us, provide uh, some specific property of soot, but not the whole picture. If we want to know the whole picture, including the structural, chemical, and optical property of soot, we need to combine different techniques. And uh, so far, as we see in the community, they use the exitus spectroscopic technique, for example, Raman, Fourier transform infrared, UV absorption property, X-ray diffraction, or X-ray absorption spectroscopy, and also high resolution tame image. And I will go um, now some of the technique. Let me start with the Raman spectroscopy. Because this is the lecture, so I support uh, some of you as students, so I go from the basic things. When the light encounters molecules, it will scatter. And the pre predominant mode is a lattice scattering or Rayleigh scattering, where the scatter photon are unchanged. Or it's the same, the frequency of the incident light here, as you can see here and a very small fraction of photon will be scattered in a lattice leaf. And that we call Raman scattering, where the frequency is shipped from the, the, the frequency of the incident light. And each material gives us a specific shift of the frequency so with the Raman, if we look at the Raman, we can know the structural property of the material. And in order to obtain the Raman, how can we build a Raman spectrometer? It's actually quite simple. So we need a light source and a sample. Then we also need um, optical component to collect the scatter light. In the, the optical component, we need the filter to cut off the Rayleigh scattering because the Rayleigh scattering is, is very strong compared to Raman scattering. And then the scatter photon go to the monostrometer connected to detector to uh, spatially separate and record the Raman signal. This is the basis Raman spectrometer. Of course, depending on our diff 
different application, we can modify it. So in our work, in order to produce soot, we use a chamber we call nanogram. So it's contained the reactor chamber and the sampling chamber connected by an area here. And the area here is have a cone, as you can see here, the cone with the a hole on the top. In the reactor chamber, we have a, a burner installed horizontally. By changing the distance between the burner and the cone, we can collect soot at different flame height. And the soot used to the pressure different, the soot particle in the flame go through the cone and deposited on the substrate inserted into the sampling chamber. So we study a lot of different flame condition. And here I show you an example of four different flame condition. So you see from the top to the bottom, we have uh, four different flame with different equivalent ratio and pressure. At the same flame height, we can collect soot. Their color are different. It means that their property are also different. And here I show you the Raman spectra of them. So we see that their Raman spectra are different. Each spectrum here contains the Raman signal superimposed on the fluorescent background. And for the brown suit, you see it has a quite strong fluorescent signal compared to black suit. And for the Raman signal, it contains the first order and the second order. The first order consists of two predominant modes, D and G peaks, that we will go into detail later. Between the first and the second order, in some type of suit, we also see the polyene mode. This is uh, not uh, popular in uh, Rama spectra of soot. In order to study the formation of soot along the flame, we need to collect soot at different flame heights. And here I show you uh, the Rama spectra of soot at different flame heights of four flame condition. So all the spectra are normalized with the real peak intensity. So here you have uh, the, inten the normalized intensity at a function of Raman shift. And in this axis, this is the flame height. So you see, when we increase flame height, the D peak intensity increase compared to the G peak. For all flame condition, we see that. And this intensity ratio, it can reach to three in some flame condition, for example here, in the when equivalent ratio is around 1.05. And in order to get more information of the sample, we need to deconvolute the spectra. Okay, so as I told you, the first order contain two predominant modes, D1 and G. The D1 is correspond to the pretty most of aromatic ring in our sample. And it's only activated when it have a defect. So we cannot see D1 in graphene, perfect graphene. The G peak is in the graphic mode. It indicates the stretching mode of two carbon atom in aromatic ring and olefinic change. Additionally, we also have uh, some other peak, sorry, some other peak, this is D2 peak. D2 peak is, uh, uh, is, is uh, located very close to the G peak and D2 peak indicates for the defects of our sample. D3 peak in the area between D1 and G indicate for the amorphous contained in our sample. And D4 peak is due to the, um, the stretching mass of uh, a carbon, uh, uh, the, the, the single bond and double bond of carbon atom in polyene-like structure. 
The second order is the combination and uh, overtone of the first order. In the second order, the 2D1 mode is very interesting. It's always appear in our sample, no matter the sample have a defect or no. Um, so with the Raman picture, if you know the peak position, you have you know the chemical structure and the functional roof in our sample. The peak week with give us the information of uh, the disorder. The the larger with correspond to the more disorder material, and the intensity ratio between D one and three peak often used to uh, indicate the maturity of our sample. And it can be used to determine the optical band gap or the polyaromatic unit mean size or the, the size of the basis structure unit that I mentioned before. So after analyzing the data, if we consider the peak width of the D1 and G, we see that our sample, our suit sample, as you see the, the, the data here, and the, the suit sample from literature so the G, uh, the width of the re peak is uh, in between the area between the graphite and amorphous carbon. So it means that for soot, is the it have a disorder structure rather than amorphous carbon or uh, crypto. And from this one, we can estimate the polyaromatic unit mean size of our sample is smaller than two nanometer because longer than two nanometer normally is graphite structure. And uh, let me continue with uh, what I already mentioned from the Rama spectra. How can we determine the polyaromatic unit mean size? If we looking back in history. Uh, in 1970, Tunstra and Conin study on graphite material, and they found that the intensity ratio between D and G bit proportional to inverse of the polysilic uh, aromatic uh, unit mean size. Uh, however, this law, uh, this relationship is broken when the size of the basic structure units go lower than two nanometer, sorry, um, lower than two nanometer here, yeah, okay. So when the um, AOA lower than two nanometer, then the relation between ID and G ratio is suggested by Federer and Robinson, where they see that this intensity ratio is proportional to swear um, uh, of AOA. Let's see if this relation is correct in our case. Okay, here I just want to uh, remind you that we cannot use Tunstra and Conin relationship to determine LA of suit because it's applied for LA larger than two. Okay, for our turn back to our sample. So from Rama spectra, we can determine the intensity ratio between D and G mod. And from that, we use federal robinson relation to determine LA. And we see that when ID ID ratio is higher than two, then LA is higher than two. It's actually against the boundary condition of the federal robinson relationship. So this relationship can not, uh, it not apply for our sample when we have a intensity ratio between D and G is larger than two. And uh, I also try to see the connection between this intensity ratio and the posi uh, position of G peak. So we see that when the, uh, the intensity ratio between D and G increase, the position of G peak uh, have a blue shift. This is actually understandable because uh, if you remember in near the G position, we have a G and D2 bit. And the D2 bit is originally from the defect in our sample. So when 
we in, when the RDI ratio increase or our material become more mature, mm -hmm. then the the defects, the number of defects is reduced. So the position of repeat, the big repeat will shift to the uh, shorter wavelength range. Okay, and uh, we want actually in order to determine AOA, we have all the techniques for sample X-ray diffraction spectroscopy and high resolution 10 image. Let me compare the Raman and other techniques to see uh, if they are uh, comparable. So here I show you uh, two same image of soot uh, produced in the same flame at different heights. The first one is at 20 millimeter and the second one is 50 millimeter. And uh, this is the collaboration with Professor uh, Pascaline Priest in France. And from her analysis, she found that the, the, the average um, polyaromatic uh, unit mean size of our sample is around 0 0.34 in the, the first case and 0 0.49 uh, nanometer in the second case. So if we compare this value with the value obtained from Raman, so we see it's a big difference. Uh, so what we can say here is, if we want to consider the maturity of our sample in the flame, we should use one technique. We should not compare uh, Raman, the value obtained from Raman with the value from uh, high resolution 10 MA because each technique will give a different value. Okay. Let me continue. So uh, Rama spectroscopy is very popular, but it's normally combined with all the techniques as a infrared spectroscopy to get a, a complete picture of uh, vibration mode of our sample. Because the condition to have a Raman mode is we need to have uh, the change in polarizability of our sample when it's vibrated. And in some case, for example, I show here, this is the vibration of diatomic. If you look at the second, uh, the se the second uh, column here, this is asymmetric vibration. And the, poly uh, the pol polarizability are unchanged during this vibration. So it's have uh, no Raman. So if we use Raman, we cannot detect this vibration. However, the permanent dipole moment of the molecule change during the right vibration. And we can use infrared to detect that. So you see very strong infrared uh, peak here. Now, for the SUS sample, in order to uh, apply the infrared absorption spectroscopy, normally we use the mid. Uh, infrared region from 400 to 4,000 centimeter inverse. And in this region, uh, we can divide it into four small spectrum regions correspond to four different bonding. Basically, it's based on uh, the rule that stronger bond have a larger fog constant K and vibrate at higher frequency than weaker bond and heavier atom vibrates at lower frequency. So if you compare here, for example, if you see here uh, the bonding between two carbon atoms and here the carbon atom and hydrogen, because hydrogen is lighter than carbon, so the vibration bond between carbon and hydrogen appear as a uh, higher frequency compared to CC stretching bond. For our suit sample, here I show you the comparison between the infrared and Raman spectra of the same suit. So you see the D1 and G in the Raman indicate for the you know, pristine modes of aromatidrine and the stretching modes of carbon-carbon uh, carbon atom in aromatidrine and olefinic uh, trans. Uh, they are indicated in the infrared spectra by the, the, the pink peak and the blue peak here. 
and uh, interesting. Uh, so you can see that here we, in this region, we also have a some peak. Uh, and in this region, it also have a some peak. Actually, the peak here, this is the carbonine peak or the bonding between carbon and oxygen in our sample. But is it very difficult to observe this peak in Raman spectra? So by using the infrared, we can detect some other vibration in our sample. If we, you want to know more information, you can go, uh, you can read um, our publication. Okay, so when the sample is excited by visible and infrared rhythm, it can give us the information of vibration and rotation. Of course, in our case with soot, we don't have a vibration because it's lattice, so we only have a vibration, no rotation. Now, if we share the sample with the lights from um, visible, UV to visible, then it can probe the information of electronic transition in our sample. Okay, here I show you the spec, the 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 spec, the absorption spectra of soot in the UV visible region. So, soot is strongly absorbed from UV to infrared. However, the organic compound, including polysilic aromatic hydrocarbon, only absorb in the near infrared. Using this information, we can determine the optical band gap of soot and organic carbon on our sample. We know from the correlation, uh, the relation between the absorption coefficient and the uh, energy and optical band gap of our sample of all the material. Then from this re relation, in order to optical band gap, we need to do like this. Of course, you can read our publication to, uh, to know more. Here I just summarized. Okay, here we have uh, the absorption spectrum of soot. And remember that the soot it absorbs the whole wavelength range. Organic compound absorb in the infrared range. So for the wavelength lower than 700 nanometer, the absorption costs are uh, contributed by only soot. Now, if we uh, we plot the square root of a composition between absorption coefficient and energy as a function of energy, so we have uh, this reason it contributed by only soot. And remember that the optical band gap is the threshold for photon to be absorbed. So uh, when we extrapolate this reason to zero absorption, we can have uh, we will have uh, the optical band gap of soot. And uh, from this curve, we can extrapolate the absorption spectra of only soot. This is the red curve here. And we use the original spectra, subtract the absorption spectra of soot, then we have the absorption spectra of organic compound, the blue curve here. And we do the same, then we can determine the optical band gap of our organic carbon in our soot sample. And from our study, we see that ours, the, the for soot material, we have optical band gap is very from zero nearly zero to one EV. And the optical band gap of organic carbon is around 1.5 to 2.5 EV. So now we combine the optical band gap with the information of Raman spectra. So we see, we see that the optical band gap decreased when we increase high above the burner and we increase the intensity ratio between ID and ID ratio in drama spectra of soot. And also when optical band gap decrease, we also see the repeat trip toward lower frequency. From our data, we can fit and we see the relation between 
intensity ratio between ID and ID and optical pan gap. And if we compare with uh, what we see in this rater, they are not the same. Um, so we think uh, it's clear that in our case, the dependence of uh, optical band gap and airway is stronger. And we think it may be the effect of uh, retarculation and stacking on the electronic structure in our sample. Okay, so the conclusion in this, uh, the first part is when we consider the evolution of soot in the plane, when we increase high above the burner, the optical band gap of our sample decrease, the intensity ratio between ID and ID peak increase, and the re peak shift toward lower frequency also because, because the structure become more order. So the width of the peak become narrower. And in our sample, we see the HP hybridization is not popular in all the suit material. Another important thing is the Federer Robinson formula is broken when the intensity ratio between D and G is larger than two. Uh, and, and, so, and also some other interesting finding. But that is something I want you to remember when you try to apply the Rama spectroscopy of soot. Okay, uh, let me move to the second part. So uh, a lot of scientists, they use ex situ uh, measurement. Ex situ is mean that we deposit the sample on the filter and then we perform the measurement on that filter at ambient condition. The question is, what factor can introduce uh, bias in ex situ measurement? And uh, how can we uh, overcome that? In order to answer that, uh, let I remind you about the ex situ and I introduce the new concept of online spectroscopy. So ex situ is mean that we deposit the sample on the surface and then we perform the measurement. And online is mean that we uh, uh, excite the sample in the aerosol phase and we detect the signal. So in the online technique, we don't have uh, the sampling process. And also the interaction time between the particle and the sample is very short compared to ex situ measurement. And uh, yeah, back to two questions I asked you. The first one is, do the sampling process influence on soot nanostructure? And the second one is, can soot structure change during the Raman measurement? In order to answer that, I perform, we perform um, two experimental. The first one is we uh, perform Rama spectra of soot, the same soot at different phase. Uh, the black curve here is Raman spectra of soot in the aerosol using online Raman technique. And then this soot deposited on a filter uh, at the same condition. In this case, it's low pressure. Then we have uh, the Rama spectra is the red curve here. And then we bring that sample to the ambient condition and perform ex situ measurement. Then we have uh, the Rama spectrum at the blue curve here. So after subtract the background, then we have uh, the Rama spectra here. In order to get more information, we need to analyze, we need to solve the spectra. And we fit the spectra with uh, a combination of different uh, Gaussian peak. So what we see is the width of all peak in the aerosol phase is larger than in the deposited phase. It means that the sample in the aerosol phase is uh, more disordered. And the second thing is, if you look at in the spectrorism uh, around um, 1700 to 2000,000 uh, centimeter inverse, you see that the C1 and C2 big decrease and then disappear. C1 and C2 actually the carbon chain structure or the triple bond and double bond in our sample. So they are unstable and they are affected by the sampling process and atmospheric pressure. Then we can answer the first question. So the sampling process may influence on the soot nanostructure. 
The second question is, can the structure change during ex situ Raman measurement? In order to do that, we are uh, using a mini class to generate uh, to produce two different types of suit, OP1 suit and OPC suit, OP1 is black suit and OPC is brown suit. The second one has a higher organic compound compared to the first one. And then we measure the sample, put the sample in a link camp heat state. Uh, and then we have uh, the gas go through the link camp. So we perform the measurement in the air and in nitrogen environments. So the sample were exposed to the laser radiation with different time before performing Raman measurement in nitrogen. So we see uh, when we measure in nitrogen, the Raman spectra of black and brown suit are quite stable. However, when we perform the measurement in the air, we see that the brown suit is strongly affected, especially the fluorescent signal keep increasing. This means that suit was oxidized during ex situ measurement. And the sample with higher organic compounds is easier to be oxidized. So, so in order to avoid the sampling, uh, the, the, the bias caused by sampling process and also the oxidation, we, uh, we recommend the online Raman technique. And here I present the, the application of online Raman technique to study suit formation. We turn back uh, with the nanogram. Uh, as I mentioned previously, so it's the, the suit sample produced from the flame can be attracted into the sampling chamber. And here we have uh, the suit beam. The suit beam is excited by a CW laser. And the scatter photon were obtained at 90 degree configuration. If we change the height, the, the height above the burner, or in this case, the distance between the burner and the cone here, we can study the formation of soot in the flame. So here I show you the evolution of um, soot in the aerosol phase at a specific flame condition. So from the bottom to the top, there are Raman spectra of flame byproducts. And here I zoom in the spectra at low flame height. So you see uh, here, the peak around 3,000 centimeter inverse is the ethylene peak. The ethylene is the fuel of our flame. So the fuel, de when we increase high above the burner, the fuel decrease. At the same time, the Raman signal of soot appears. And the Raman signal of soot continue to increase. So each spectrum here is contained the Raman signal, superimposed on top of the fluorescent signal. So, from the, the spectra, we see that the decrease of the fuel that I plot again in this finger, and then the Raman signal of suits, we see not only sp 2 bond D and G peak, we also see C1 and C2 peak. C2 peak. This is the uh, SP hybridization. And also the redshift of uh, fluorescent signal. And if we uh, um, deconvolute the sample, uh, the spectra, using a combination of nine Gaussian peaks, we will see that the full width at maximum of D and G peak is around 200 centimeter inverse. It's much larger than deposited suit. And the second thing is the we have a high fraction of SP bond in our suit. And if we consider the evolution of the spectra along the flame height, 
we can explain the formation of soot in the gland started from the formation of soot precursor. Here you can see here, this is actually the Raman spectra of um, large PAH. And then it start to form the incipient particles. And then the Raman increase and become larger and larger signal. So if you want to know more information, please follow my published paper. Okay, for to conclude, the second part. The first thing is, F C two method is very strong and should be used. But when you use that, be careful. Some soot sample which have a higher organic compound may be oxidized during the measurement. So is it better to perform the measurement in the emit environment? And the second thing is, uh, the advantage of online spectroscopic technique is to avoid the uh, structure change during the sampling process and also the interaction time between the sample and the laser. And for the online technique, it's able to detect the gas species to the particle. So it's very valuable to study the formation of soot in the flame. Okay. Now we continue with the third part uh, of this lecture, where I will show you um, some application of soot. Uh, the first one is we use spec Raman spectra to determine the structure property of different type of soot. For example, here I show you OP1 and OP6 soot produced from um, mini class soot. This is actually premise propane air plane. So you see uh, brown suit show different Raman spectra compared to that of black suit. And uh, we also have another study where we use, we uh, use uh, Raman spectra to study the oxidation and the um, thermal um, process of suit. We put the sample in the link cam and then we heat the sample from ambient temperature to 1000 degrees Celsius. And we observe the structure change in our sample. Uh, this work already published uh, in Combustion and Flame Journal. So you can read that one to have more information. Uh, another one is we can use the online spectroscopic technique, in this case online Raman, for quantitative and qualitative measurement of soot in the flame. Here I show you the spectrum of soot produced from um, um, mini class soot. So this is the online Raman. So we can detect at the same time the Raman signal of soot, as you can see, be here, to be here, D and G. And the fluorescent signal of organic compound. At the same time, we can detect the Raman spectra of all the gases produced from combustion process, for example, CO, CO2, um, uh, acetylene is very interesting here. This is the soot precursor, water vapor, and also the oxygen and nitrogen contributed from the, um, the air. So if we want to obtain only Raman signal of soot, we, we, we can apply the polarization effect. For example here, when the polarization of the incident light is vertical, then we have the Raman signal of soot and Raman signal of the gases. When we rotate the polarization of the, ra of the incident light, so the Raman signal of the gas clearly decrease, but the Raman signal of soot, of course, is decreased due to the absorption of the polarizer, but the shape of the Raman signal of soot doesn't change. And we have other study uh, I put here, where we demonstrated that the Raman signal of soot is unpolarized. That's the reason why when we apply this, the polarization effect to this one, we can have uh, the Rama signal of soot separate from the Rama signal of the Yafe species. 
uh, the question is, we did a lot of um, study of suit in the laboratory scale. Can we apply this technique at atmospheric condition? So in order to answer that question, we need to know the Raman cross-section of suit. If it's large, then it may be possible for detecting suit in the atmosphere. And in order to measure the Raman cross-section of suit, uh, we have uh, one study on that that already published. So we miss uh, suit with uh, water at different uh, um, concentration, and then we perform the Raman signal. Then we compare the Raman signal of suit and the Raman signal of water that we already know the Raman cross-section. From that, we can determine the Raman cross-section of uh, suit. Uh, and in our study, we study suit and some other black carbon material. So in general, the Raman cross-section of suit and black carbon is around 10 to a power of minus 28. So um, centimeters um, square per steel radian per carbon atom at an excitation wavelength 532 nanometer. And this value is actually called large value. It's around 100 to 1,000 times higher than the Raman cross-section of oxygen, nitrogen, and um, uh, water vapor. Uh, and the important thing is when we perform, we detect suit in the atmosphere, the challenge is we have a Raman signal of oxygen and water vapor interfere to Raman signal of suit. So we need to subtract that. And uh, let I do some uh, pre-calculation. So if the suit concentration in the atmosphere is one mic uh, microgram per cubic meter, then we use the polarization uh, effect. Then we have uh, the signal of soot is around 1,000 times lower than the signal of oxygen. So then it's very difficult to see Raman signal of soot. However, when the concentration of soot is 100, 100 times higher, it may occur in some uh, accident, for example, fire, forest fire, or some fire. Then we see that the Raman signal of soot compared to Raman signal of oxygen in the air is just uh, 10 times lower. So it's uh, clearly observable. So it can be applied this technique in the atmosphere. And uh, recently we detect suit in the atmosphere using LIDAR. We have no time to present it in detail, but here I just uh, give a very short um, description. So we have a, a suit, we burn suit at a distance around 100 meter from the the detector and we we are uh, exposed different type of aerosol soot pollen powder and many different types and interesting that we can detect the signal and not only the signal at a function of wavelength but we can know where the sample is here i show you a video of the okay how is it yeah so so at the beginning time the signal of soot very low, but then it suddenly increase when we have a more soot. And in this acid, you, you can see we can range in the signal. So hopefully I can present it in another occasion. Okay, so um, a conclusion for the third part. The Rama signal of soot and carbon material are unpolarized. So we can apply this to separate Rama signal of gases from soot. And the second thing is we can use in Raman not only for uh, qualitative measurement, but also for quantitative measurement. For example, you, did, uh, you determine the Raman cross-section or you determine the concentration of our sample. And the last thing is uh, Raman cross-section of soot are large and is feasible for detection in the atmosphere. And uh, thank you very much for your listening. And this is actually the photo of our division uh, from yesterday. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Kwong. Thank you very much. Very, very interesting, uh, very interesting talk. Um, mm -hmm. So I'll, um, it's time for, for questions now. So I passed the virtual microphone to, to the audience. If someone has question, please uh, 
feel feel free to ask them to our how to, um okay professor to quote <clears throat> we maybe i should keep uh, i know i should keep sharing yeah okay so i guess i can i can start um I have a question regarding the, um, the sampling of uh, soot uh, particles um, yeah. and the fact that doing the samplings actually yeah, modifies the, the, the structure of soot. Uh, yeah. Does um, do, do soot particles behave like uh, as like more like a, a solid um, sphere, let's say a solid amorphous uh, um, object or they are more like droplets? So they behave like a liquid, sort of, sort of liquid. So it's this that modifies the structure, the fact that, you know, if we put a droplet on a, on a surface, the droplet is gonna, you know, expand its, uh, reduce the thickness and expand its volume. But does this happen for soot as well when you do, when you sample it? Yeah, uh, okay. Uh, so uh, actually when I uh, perform the Raman measurement for soot, deposited soot and aerosol soot, we see that for soot produced in low pressure plane, uh, for example, in this case, due to the pressure difference, so soot from the flame can go into the sanding chamber and deposit on this, uh, the substrate. So, so then the force due to the pressure difference is very, very much, then it's influenced on the, uh, the, the, uh, the particle will coll collide that is influenced on, on the structure of soot. And also when we print the sample to ambient air condition used to the pressure, so it's influenced on the sample. That is what I see from the soot produced in low pressure plane. For the mini cast soot, that is the soot produced in atmospheric condition, then I don't see the sampling process influence on the, this type of soot particle. Uh, turn back to your question about the mis the sample into the liquid and then put it on the substrate. So I would say that when you mix the sample into the solid, actually you change the modification the morphology of the sample. It looks like that the soot generate into atmosphere and it collide with the water vapor to form cloud. So it's clearly change the structure and the morphology of the sample. Yes, it is. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I I my okay. Can I ask a question? Yeah, sure, sure. Yes, Macron. Hi, Kwon. Hi, Macron. Nice to see you here. Nice to see you. Uh, I was wondering, have you ever tried to study the uh, the influence of heteroatoms on soot, like for example, nitrogen? There are, you know, like in some fuels like um, plastics or uh, coal or biomass, there is, for example, nitrogen or uh, phosphorus. Have you ever tried to, to, to study if these atoms may have an influence on soot formation and how they can? Uh... Um, I would guess it's influence, but I, I have uh, not studied on that. So I think. Uh, I would say it's influence. I, I, we haven't know that study, but we have a study where we insert the potassium into the, 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 the flame. Then we see that the absorption property decreased in that case. And the uh, distance between the graphite layer of should become lower. Mm. Could be interesting to study also other atoms like nitrogen. Yeah, could be. Uh, yeah, we never study that. Just the potassium because we interacted in uh, the biomass application. We have a lot of potassium in biomass. Yeah, yeah. A lot, but we have a dust uh, element in biomass. Yeah. So we study that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for your question. Are there other questions from, from the audience? Well, if not, I have what I think will be the last question for our speaker. Um, 
more generic, let's say. Um, how well, um, in your opinion, how well online uh, spectroscopy can help us understand um, what is, I think, the most challenging part of suit modeling of suit formation, which is like the, the inception stage, I believe, when, you know, where we have gas uh, molecules, the PAH, that at some point they uh, turn from the gas phase to the to the this solid uh, phase. And what's what's your opinion on them? Um... My opinion is this is a great technique for that study because um, most of the techniques they focus on the uh, study in the the size evolution, and for the structure evolution, it's not many techniques. And to my knowledge, is no technique can cover from gas phase molecule to particle. And with the online Raman, we can do that. Of course, it's ever challenging. For example, because at uh, low flame height, the concentration of the either of, of the PAH is quite low, and the particle is low, so it needs a uh, longer acquisition time. For example, here you can see in the, okay, you can see my the mouse. Mm -hmm. You yeah, see sure. the picture here at low uh, flame height, so the signal to noise is not good. Yeah, yeah. Compared to flame, high flame height. But it's possible, and I, I think it's a promising technique for that study. Yeah, great. Yeah. No, it would be really nice to understand if, yeah, it, that's, it's because of the stacking of pH on each, on it, yeah, on uh, on themselves, or they are like more amorphous, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, connection, aliphatic structure between the layers with between the pH. It's uh, still, yeah, and open question and uh, yeah i hope that uh, this technique can give us more insights yeah thank you very much okay thank you uh, i guess if there are no more questions for the audience uh, we can uh, we can close this session we can we thank again the, the speaker thank you Huang, for for your interesting uh, interesting presentation uh, it was very interesting especially also for me that i'm not an expert in uh, in suit, I guess most of the audience here is not. So it was great to hear from you about these uh, measurement techniques for for suit formation. Okay, and uh, thank you again. And uh, I'll uh, I'll see you and um, hopefully to hope to see you in one of the next uh, lecture. The next one will be in one week. So I'll um, we'll see you there, everyone. Thanks. Have a good uh, have a good evening and, uh, and a nice weekend. Yes, thank you. The same. Yeah, have a nice weekend, all of you. <laughs> thank you. Yes. Bye bye. Bye.